My name's Karen Webster and I'm the very proud Dean and Principal here at LCI in Melbourne. And I pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on which our campus is situated. I pay respects and acknowledge the elders past, present and the future generations and acknowledge all of the staff, students and friends of LCI across the globe who are First Nations people. Wow, we're having a moment. A moment that is a creative moment. We've been through a crazy period where life has been really complex. But now we are about to make a difference. Creative people are going to change the world. And here at LCI, I couldn't be prouder because our institute works in a completely different way. We're unique. We're unique in a number of ways. Most importantly, we don't put people into little boxes. We're about the cross-pollination of creative thinking. I look around me, the work here that is done by our staff and students, a collaboration, working together, co-design. Is it an art installation? Is it landscape gardening, horticulture? Is it interior design? Actually, it's all three, and a fusion, a hybrid of creative thinking coming together. So it creates its whole new own independent genre. And that's what we're about. We're about finding solutions that are new, that are fresh, getting you to explore completely different ways of doing things. Come with us on a bit of a journey today. You're gonna to meet some amazing staff, our mentors, we call them, our academics here. They're not just teachers, they work in their own practice. They're creative leaders, and they're gonna share with you some of the way that we do things here. Here we are on our amazing campus. If you look around us, I think one of the things we're proud of here is we embrace diversity. We embrace everybody. Uh -huh. We embrace responsibility. Look at our fantastic upcycled wall that is taken from pieces when we designed this building. You'll notice a series of flags, including the inclusive flag, but flags from across the globe because we have people here from all cultures. What we help you do is find your space. And equally important is, you may not want to come onto this campus at all. You might completely want to join us online. You know, I know a lot of people say, can you teach creative uh, subjects and, and programs online? We can. We have such a personal touch with all of our students. The experience of working with us online is as engaged, is as exciting, and helps you find your space. So whatever it is that you need, come here. You're a safe place to discover, to experiment, to explore, to challenge and speculate. And out of that, you will become the best creative you can be. Come with me now and we're going to meet one of our mentors. That's what we call our academics here. The amazing thing about our academics is every single one of them is a practicing artist or designer. So that means they actually understand the creative industries. They're exceptionally well networked. Michael, for example, we're going to meet now, is an Archibald Prize finalist. We've got a couple of them on our team. So let's come in now and meet Michael and actually get really inspired. Michael, that's fantastic. I love it. Okay, tell us what you're working on. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, Look, this is an old skateboard that has traveled around the world with me. Mm -hmm. um, look, it looks quite nice now. Yesterday, it didn't look so good. I've um, taken the sandpaper to it, sanded it back. You can see one side of it still looking pretty ratty and it's got a lot of chips out of it. But um, I love this idea of being able to take something old that I've held on to for sort of like the last 20 years since I was an avid skater and now be able to turn it into something that I can put onto the wall. It's so beautiful. And it kind of tells a story, like when you're working with clients, do you find that it's really important to understand the narrative of the creative process and, and give the, does it have more meaning when it's got a story like that? Yeah, I think so. Like if, 
if I'm commissioned by someone to, to create a painting or even if I'm going to paint a, a work for, a, for an exhibition, I really feel that it's important that there's inherent meaning in the work. So you work across a number of different mediums and different sizes, different methods? Yeah. I mean, um, as a background, I'm a traditional oil painter and right. I, I create... I'm often creating photorealistic paintings um, on a really large scale. Um, so the opportunity to work small like this whenever I can, just to sketch and sort of be able to start a work and finish it in a half a day is a really nice process because oil paintings take a long time. Is there anything you can't do? <laughs> That's amazing. So when you did the Archibald Prize, the one that you became finalist in, was that in a portrait in oils? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's um, that probably took me maybe 30, 40 days to complete. Wow. Lots of layers, lots of building up, lots of planning. Right. Yeah. But, you you know, as an artist, it's really important to be prolific. It's really important to really focus on your work. And uh, so this is going to end up on your wall, is it? Yeah, yeah. Building a new house at the moment, a lot of wall space, <laughs> needs, um, oh, needs some stuff to go. Michael, this is fascinating. So you're explaining the process so in terms of the process that I'm going to go through, the first thing I'm going to do is I'll sand this down and I'll actually take this board from looking like this to looking like the one that I'm working on. And then, um, you know, so once I've gone over the whole thing enough with the sander, it's going to look quite nice. It's still going to have some rough edges, but I think it needs a bit of that still in it there. It needs that patina, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, and then basically I'd sketch out the drawing that I'm going to work on. Um, I'm probably going to do a little bit of an underpaint. I've got um, a really good quality gesso, which is a, which is a sort of like an underpaint, which painters use traditionally to, to paint their canvases yep. white with. So I'm going to work with that and then I'm going to use that as the base to, to build the drawing up on. It's really fantastic. So all we're going to do is we're going to leave you here to do your work and to immerse yourself in it. We're going to go and meet some of the other mentors and see what they're working on and then come back and see where you're at. And I'd love to ask you some more questions also of just how you're working with the students. So we'll be back soon. Thanks Excellent. heaps, Michael. It's absolute inspiration. Thanks, Karen. See you later. I couldn't think of a better moment to be a designer. Creative people are problem solvers. They, they're eager to find the solutions. And we're living in a world at the moment where we need our problems resolved and solved. And it's designers that work out ways of how to do things best. That's why it's an ideal career trajectory for you to even think about coming into. Sometimes I hear these strange things like, why would you want to be an artist? You won't get a job. But that's crazy speak in our current climate because what we want at the moment is people who are innovative, who naturally research and discover the solutions to our problems. I look at the kind of work of our students, like this beautiful work here by Maddie White. Maddie was a photographer and she, in COVID lockdown, went home to her family farm and really wanted to create something and to be an artisan. And she worked on these incredible sculptural pieces. And how did she make this piece? She built her own forge. That's what creative people do. They find ways of creating magic in a world where we're overwhelmed with all the issues that are impacting us. We make your life a delight. Let's go and see some more work. And we've just been in with Michael and he's reimagining skateboards. It looks like you're doing a bit of reimagination yourself. I am. I'm a bit of an armchair addict and a bowerbird. And um, this was a find from a couple of years ago um, in the hard rubbish. I'm always yeah. on the lookout. Uh, chairs are one of my perfect design elements. You know, they're this great idea of sculpture, of aesthetics and of function. So they tick all of the boxes for Brings me. It all together. Yeah. And I love the idea of... Um, bringing history into interiors, so even into modern interiors, and really making sure that they feel like they've had a lived experience, even if they're all brand new. My idea is to um, honour its history, but also bring it into today. So when someone puts a date on it, that's they've made it with love because that, that becomes part of its history. So. Uh, Take us through what you're doing because these fabrics are fantastic. Yeah, so what I um, what I always do are 
doing them myself is a bit of a passion project. I do reupholster um, with professionals for clients. Um, I always think though, as a designer or a creative, it's good to understand the process. So part of the reason I love upholstering my own pieces is because it gives me a chance to really deconstruct the furniture and explore how it's put together. And it gives me a really great appreciation for craftsmen, um, workmanship, and also um, the value of really good design. I want, I want to ask you a few questions about Petrina Turner because sure. we're really, really lucky to have you teaching into our program, but there are so many other things you are doing and that you've got in your repertoire. So are you just saying that you've got clients, so you've got your own interior design practice? I do. I'm a bit of a slashy. So, a slashy. I'm, <laughs> so I'm an interior designer, stylist, a maker. Um, and also an educator, which I really love. But I also see um, education across everything that I do, whether it's talking to students or clients. Um, I think education is king and it really does, it's a really great tool to help people think about the world in a different way yeah. and create unexpected outcomes. Uh, I've seen the work you've done for the Asylum Resource Centre, amazing work for a really worthy cause. So, you, you pour heart and soul into what you do, but with real integrity, you also support a community which uh, may not be as advantaged as we have the opportunity to be. So tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing for them. Yeah, so I started as um, a general population volunteer about 12 years ago with them, and um, I was just you know yelling at the TV because I was so angry about the language that was used around people seeking asylum in Australia, and I just knew I needed to do something. So um, I started as a volunteer taking um, people seeking asylum here to appointments, and then a number of years ago they were moving house, if you like, into a new building, and um, I cornered Con, their CEO, and said, look, I'm a designer, if you need any help let me know because what I also appreciate is that um, design and interior design is often seen as a real luxury it doesn't have to be but it's certainly seen as that and um, everybody deserves to have a space that nurtures them space is something that really defines how we feel about ourselves and each other so I um, realized that these people who come here without anything and without a home, it was really important. And Con's idea is to create a home away from home for them. So I just put my hand up and said, anything you need, let me know. And again, it was a really collaborative um, effort that, you know, you talk to, to everybody. To me, that's true luxury. That's yeah. what luxury should be, is when you create an environment for someone that makes them feel great, safe, inspired, and has beauty all around it. Yeah, but whatever it is, I think students um, should follow their passions and it makes everything a better place Design to has a live purpose. in. And, and it brings great things to the whole world and it makes people's lives better. Yeah. And every day, Petrina, I see you and you bring joy to all of our students and to myself personally. We're going to pop back later right. and just see what else you're working on. And I'm off to see Todd now over in the fashion and costume area. That sounds so, fabulous. Thanks, yeah, Carrie. It's fun. Thanks, Petrina. Bye. See you later. Karen. You're mixing up a bit of magic here. I surely am. I'm mixing up a couple of different inks uh, to do a screen print. Oh, fantastic. Oh, the students are so lucky they get to learn all of these things. Um, you teach in fashion and costume. Mm -hmm. The fashion industry has been going through a bit of a tough time mm -hmm. and people have been highly critical of it and understandably mm -hmm. so. And I know for a lot of our future students, they're often concerned. They ask us the questions like, is it the right industry to be going into? And I would say single-handedly, Todd Anthony is taking that issue on and working out really great ways that we can create and design that ha embraces responsible innovation. Well, can I tell you that this is a topic so close to my heart yeah, okay. and this is the most important time, I think, to be a designer and in design education, specifically in fashion, because it is about being responsible and being innovative at yeah. the same time. And um, so I have to practice what I preach. And uh, so I make a point of doing that. So that's what I'm up to today. So, so vegan, people often just think vegan is about what you put in 
into your body, <laughs> but you or your collection is vegan. Yes, it is. I'm vegan, and so I, I avoid uh, me personally with my practice. I don't force this on my students. I always talk to them about the options, and then yep. they can make their own decisions. Uh, but I don't work with wool or silk or leather. Anything that's animal derived, I avoid. Um, so bamboo. Not only is it does it grow up instead of out, um, uh, was a good choice for me and my practice, um, and. And um, so protecting not only nature holistically as the earth and the environment, but also our furry friends is really important. And the nice thing about our industry is that even the big players in the game are changing the way that they view um, animal hides and animal skins and fur. And um, so it makes sense that we do that at grassroots level here with our students too. So I'm mixing up, uh, the reason why I work with black, white and gray is because the inks that I get are all um, secondhand Hand. So this is all the wastage ink from other local manufacturers who screen print. So I collect what would generally go into the bin. And um, then all the waterways, which is all worse. the waterways, yeah. exactly. And um, so I mix them up. Usually they're a dark, muddy color. So it works well with like a charcoal or yep. a dark color. Sometimes it looks beautiful on the winter white, which is what I'm doing today. Um, so I'm going to do a screen print so that I can turn it into one of these beautiful things behind us. And then um, on the side next to you, I've got uh, what, what I call it cabbage, but uh, for all of the people who don't know what that is, that's the leftover fabrication from the last run of yep. the collection. So explain what a snood is, because a lot a of people snood. may not know what a snood is. Do you want to is. see one? I've got one here. So a snood is a round piece of fabric. It's like a, it's like a scarf, but it's circular. And you can just wrap it around yourself as many times as you like. And I like texture. I love it. So yes. I just... Cut, uh, cut the leftover fabric into large rectangles, create a seam, and then you can do so many different things, but I'm into fringe at the moment, because as you can see, I'm very tactile. So <laughs> I find this soothing, but you can do lots of different things with the snood. And you can that's wear them no long. waste, because no it's waste. just one piece of material. Exactly, just one piece of material. And otherwise, if, if, if they weren't turned into this type of accessory, um, it would go into landfill. and you know, why wouldn't I do this? It makes me a little bit more money as well. That's you know? fantastic. Well, we're going to leave you okay. to do your screen printing and we're going to come back and see how we might make a snood. Wonderful. See you All soon. All right. Thanks. Bye, Todd. Bye. Oh, Michael, it's beautiful. You finished it. Oh, it's fantastic. You happy with it? Yeah, really happy with it. Great work just to, to be able to make in an afternoon on a Sunday. Very enjoyable. But all the detail is phenomenal. And, you know, I'd always be worried what would happen if you made a mistake. I'm not sure. I think it's a matter of perspective. I mean, I've drawn for so long and, you know, I'm sure there's mistakes in there, but I'm not, I don't think of it that way. I think, you know, it's how the final work ends up looking, yep. which is the great thing. So you get into the zone type thing and you just, and it feels right for yeah, you. Yeah, over, over a period of time, you start to learn about mark making and the marks that you're happy with, you know. And when I was a young artist, I'd take so long trying to get everything perfect and, and get wrapped up in this idea that if something was out of place, I'd just keep focusing on it. But now I really, I'm happy with the way that I work and I'm happy with the, the language of mark making that I've created. So yep. tell me, with something like this, how would you take it back into the classroom? Like, how would you work on a project like this with students? I think it's a great one to work with students, something like this, where, yep. um, you know, you can walk into an art store and you can drop $500 quite easily on a canvas and some paints yeah. and things like that. And you don't really need to do that. You can do that if you want and if you can afford it, but really you can walk down the street, you could pick up a piece of rubbish off the side of the road, you know, like an old tabletop or a chair or something like that. Yes. And you could easily transform it into a work if you if you know how to prepare the surface and, and just bring a bit of imagination to it. So congratulations on today. When you move into your new home, I want photos to see what it looks like on the wall. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Karen. All right, all the best. I'm yeah. going to go off and see Petrina now and see how her chair is going. Great. Thank you. Oh, Trina, I'm loving the 
fabric combination. So at the moment I'm just pinning the fabric onto it to sort of see where the pattern might sit if this beautiful kind of free-flowing floral and fruits might work nicely here and, and I've just got a bit of a play with this one to see if that might be a really nice contrast of patterns and textures and what we've got is the balance of sort of the greys picking up into this fabric mm -hmm, yes. so they talk to each other. And these are quite that's almost a pink tone donkey colour there that marries up with this it, one here. It really is so um, and but why I'm doing it this way is that I could explore maybe three or four different ways to do it before I rest on what feels right for the piece. And at the moment we're seeing this uh, fabulous kind of aesthetic around the clash of pattern. Yes. But it's still got a refinement to it. So all of the materials that you're looking at have real integrity. They're high quality materials. So absolutely. That is absolutely important. And then the attention to detail that goes into every single element is, is important. Yeah, absolutely. And what I talk to um, students about is that um, interiors or any sort of space, spatial design is 100% always about humans and people and awesome. their lived experience. And so every level and layer that we talk about in a space has to consider the human touch that is associated with that. It's about the student's aesthetic. It's not about us dictating anything. It's about finding your own space mm -hmm. and I can't wait to see this finished. Yeah, I'm really excited. I to think it would look great it. in my office, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> nah, I love it. Petrina, thank you so thank much. You so We've much. had a, such a great day. Really, really enjoyed it. So inspirational. Thanks, Karen. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, this is coming oh, together. You've been back. making it. Yes. Yes, I've, I've whipped this one together. I'm just cutting my fringing because, as I said earlier on, it's like my new thing is this love of fringe. I don't know where it came from, but I'm so happy I have it. After you wear it a few times, mm. it rolls on itself. Okay. And so all of these things will become tubular. Um, and if you if you um, hang it up after you, after you've made them, um, and you put them in like a in in your bathroom and you, while you're having a shower, they'll roll even faster to create that beautiful fringing effect that I showed you earlier on. Very simple, easy to do, and um, very wearable. Oh, I this think. is such a great thing. So I'm going to ask a little bit about you and your practice and how you got to where you were today. Sure. Because now you've got your own fashion brand. Oh. How did you do that transition from costume through to fashion? Um, it was a very easy transition because um, costume and fashion, uh, it, I think if you're a good designer and you understand uh, the elements and principles of design and construction, you can really do anything. And um, I enjoyed um, costume so much. Much. But um, then when I restudied and did my master's degree, something clicked in my head. And it was actually thank you to my students because I was teaching yeah. design. And um, they said, but you're so passionate about um, uh, sustainable practices and, you know, you're vegan and rah, rah, rah. But you're not necessarily practicing that yourself. And it was such a prolific moment in my life. Where Aren't students amazing? Yeah, they, I love they, them. They inspire us as I much love as them. we would inspire them. So yes. for all those people in that year, you know who you are, um, I thank you because I wouldn't be here doing this now if it wasn't for the people that I was working with, my students. They ah, certainly so do. I've got a little snood. Unveiling moment. Let me turn it in the other way so you can see the screen print. Oh, and then. Great. So easy to do. And it goes if perfectly you, with the top you've got on. Oh, funny that. Now, you can do this with anything at home, people. If you're throwing out old sheets, do some um, some dyeing, practice some dyeing techniques at home, cut them up, turn them into a snood. And... Um, okay, so nothing is wasted. Nothing anymore. is wasted. I try not to. Maybe little bits and pieces, but not really. Oh, it looks Aren't great. they pretty? Yeah, They're I so love it. pretty and they're so good in winter. And as I said, these will all start to roll soon. But we'll... it's great just like that. Yeah, they're fun. Would you like this one, Karen? I would love that one. Oh, Todd. Oh, I'm feel wrapped. This is great. Okay. All right. I'm off, everyone. Thank you, Todd. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you 
so much for joining us today. I hope you learned something. I've been so inspired by everything. Every day you learn something new. We'd love to keep in touch. And even if you just want to come and have a little taster, a little try of something we do, we welcome you here anytime. You can join us online or pop into campus, whatever works for you. And we offer everything here from really deep diving into a degree or just having a micro credential, which is just a little snapshot of what creative practice is all about. I'm sure you've learned some great things as well. So from all of the team here at LCI, we welcome you and we can't wait to see you again. Thank you.